All right, so I'm recording this now. Um, for those that might be watching this recording later, we're starting by fixing some of the test cases that were broken um, because of the way that we uh, had, were setting a value in the init block previously. Um, JSON doesn't actually run the init blocks when it creates new instances of your class from the view, by using the JSON strings. And so we need to do that. Uh, we need to rethink how we were doing that. So I've replaced the init block and the code I checked in with a compute function that returns the result. Uh, that should work fine. We basically just copy the parameters into the result along with uh, the result of doing whatever mathematical operation we need to do. Now, when we try to run things, we see there's a few places that we need to fix stuff. Um, one of those places is here in our um, post um, request. We actually need to return the result of actually doing the computation. Um, and then over here in our test cases, we need to return fix this as well. Since this uh, object no longer has that field. So let's make sure that our test cases pass, which is our something that you know we're always doing as we develop. Okay, awesome. And now the last thing I want to do before we start talking about deployment is I actually want to make sure all the test cases pass, right? Um, you know, our web apps is sort of a weird point at this point. It kind of does this strange collection of unrelated things, but that's fine. Uh, but I still want to have one single test suite that I can run, particularly when I'm about to deploy something that makes sure that everything's working. Um, and so, well, I already kind of did this for you, but uh, when, you, when you create these, um, when I go here and I create one of these sort of um, temporary run configurations by using these um, run arrows that IntelliJ helpfully creates for me, if you go up here and actually look at how this works, what this is doing is it's running a Gradle task. So this gets set up as a Gradle run configuration by IntelliJ. It runs it in the Hello project, this is what we're working on. It runs these methods. So there's a clean step that gets run before we run the test and then it runs the test, it runs a test task. And it passes this argument down here. And this is what causes it to only run the test in the main, in test on main, in test main, sorry. And so what we want to do, is we want to run all the tests and so what, what you're going to do is you're going to set up a, a run configuration that looks like this i already have it here i'll check it in after we're done um, this runs all of the tests um, so it doesn't pass the test argument and so it'll run all the tests in the project um, let's do that make sure everything works okay so all of our test case passes uh, we feel pretty good about that uh, i also added a, a task to run the formatter so let's do that just to make sure we don't have any LinkedIn errors uh, before we get started packaging stuff up. And this should, this should work fine. Okay, um, obviously this would also be a good time to go ahead and commit, commit our work. Um, so why don't we do that as well? Um, remember how to, okay. So and let's look up here and make sure that we have everything. Uh, so we've made changes to these files. We've refactored um, the, like this. I'm not sure you guys can see this, can you? Yeah. Um, maybe you can. Can you guys can you guys see the change dialog? I don't know. Let me do let me do this a little bit differently. Actually, um, let's see. Let me share. Instead of this, I'll just share my whole desktop. There we go. Okay, and then get rid of that. Okay. So now you guys should be able to see everything. Um, so now let's go ahead and and we'll do a commit. Uh, we want to look at what's happening here and, and review the changes that we've made, uh, and we'll say ready to deploy. So we're in good shape. Tests are passing. Uh, we're going to put in a commit message. Uh, I'm just going to commit this for now. I'll push it after we're done. Okay. All right. Any questions at this point? Um, I think you know the code I pushed should have given you guys a reasonable starting point in terms of getting to where I am, uh, so we're all synced up. Uh, but now let's actually talk about how to, to deploy this thing. Okay, so there's really gonna be a couple of different steps that we're gonna take. Um, the first one is that we're going to build what's called a Java archive. Um, a Java archive or a jar file is a way of packaging up a bunch of different class files together into one place, okay? So that's gonna be step number one. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna realize that the jar file that we created actually doesn't include a bunch of the classes that we need to run our application. And so the next step is going to be to build something that's called a fat jar. Um, and a fat jar is what it sounds like. It's a jar that contains 
not just the code for our project, but the, all of the classes that our code depends on. Okay, Java has other ways of finding those classes when you run Java, but this is a really nice way of essentially kind of taking all the dependencies that our application needs and you know creating a single file that has them all in one place. Okay, so you could take this file and you could send it to anybody who has Java installed and they could run it and hopefully get the same result. All right, so that's the second step of packaging. The third step of packaging is we're gonna, we're gonna put this inside a Docker container. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what containers are once we get there, but uh, Docker containers are a modern way of essentially creating a highly uh, reproducible deployment environment. So a Docker container takes what we did previously one step further. So initially, we just packed up our own classes, okay? Um, then we packed up all the Java classes that our application would need. Now with Docker, we're actually gonna be able to pack up, you can almost think of it as like an entire machine that contains all of the dependencies that our program needs to run, including Java and all the Java libraries and everything. So now I have this, um, and it's actually much more lightweight than an entire machine, which is really nice, um, but I have just the bits that I need to run my application, and now I have something that I can move around and I can deploy to, um, to, to the cloud, right? Um, I would say restart and rejoin as Martin because the Docker parts are kind of fun. Um, okay, so let's so let's get started with the jar step first. So building a jar and using IntelliJ is quite straightforward because it includes a jar task. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, we're just going to run this task over here under the build menu in the Gradle uh, settings, and you'll see that it runs. Now you might wonder what did it do. Um, we've already kind of hidden the build directory over here. So in order to see what happened, we're actually gonna have to go uh, open up our terminal window. And we're going to look inside the build directory. There are several different subdirectories inside this build directory. This contains files that are created by IntelliJ when it builds your, builds your program. Um, it turns out that the jar files get put into this directory. Uh, if I do a detailed listing of what's in this directory, um, you're gonna see that it, this file was just created a couple minutes ago and it's about 16 kilobytes in size. Um, okay, so this is our jar file. This was created by the, uh, this build stuff. Let's actually run a clean task. When we run clean, what we'll, we'll notice is that that file no longer exists and in fact, the entire build directory is gone. There's not even a build directory anymore. Um, and so now let's run jar again and we'll be able to confirm that this file is back, okay? Um, the naming convention for this is, it's the name of your project and then a, uh, some versioning information that's drawn from build.gradle. We're not gonna worry too much about that right now. Okay, so when you um, run Java, you can actually run a jar file. So you might wonder, how do you run a Java application, right? Um, I can type Java, and I can use this jar argument, and then I need to give it a path to a jar file. So let's try doing that here, right? Uh, when we, so let's, let's, first of all, let's just remind ourselves what we expect to happen, okay? So before we do this, let's go back to our, close out some of these other windows and go back to our main, uh, main file, and let's go to our main method here, and let's use this handy feature of IntelliJ to run our program. We see this warning message, right? Uh, but if we remind ourselves what port this application is running on, and then go over here and open IntelliJ, we should be able to see that um, it's doing the right thing. So it's responding to a request for the root route by returning the result of calling hello, and hello returns hello world, okay? So that seems to be working. If I stop this um, and then go back here, this won't load anymore. Okay, so that's what I expect to happen. What I'm gonna to try to do now is get to the point where I can run this from the terminal and achieve the same behavior. So let's go back to my uh, terminal window. And here's what I'd like to work. So I'd like to be able to say Java, which is a program that I need to have installed, you know, run this jar file. So the first thing that I, first problem I have that I need to figure out how to solve is that um, whenever I run a jar file, Java needs to know what main method I want to run. Okay, 
And it does this by looking for an extra piece of information that's contained inside the jar file called manifest. The manifest is it's a term taken from shipping, right? When you ship things, you put a manifest in the container, which declares all the things that are inside that particular, um, that particular package, right? And a jar is sort of like a package. And what Java is saying is that the manifest inside this jar doesn't have information about which class we're supposed to use when you ask me to run the jar. So Java essentially wants, to tell us, wants us to tell it, where should I start, right? What function should get called first? Um, and really, actually, it wants us to tell us what class because it's going to call public static void main or the equivalent in Kotlin inside that class when we start. Okay, so the first thing you might have suspected we need to do is we actually need to, to, to modify our build.gradle file. Uh, we need to tell Gradle when it builds a jar file to include this extra piece of information in the manifest. All right, so I'm going to declare a variable and I'm going to call this main class. and the, what I need to do is I need to provide the full path to my main class. The reason why this starts with hello is that I declared that this is part of a package called hello. And we'll see when we look in a minute and what's inside this jar that that uh, package name has an impact on where our class files end up being put. Okay, so I've declared that my main method is called in the package hello. You could call this something else, but whatever you package you use, that has to be reflected in the path to the main class. And then it's actually main KT. I think we talked about this before, but um, when Kotlin compiles your code, if you give it a uh, class file called main.kt, it will create a Java class called main KT. Um, so this is what this looks like. And now I'm going to add a uh, jar. I'm going to add an extra uh, bit of configuration to my manifest. And what is it called? Is it called attributes. Um, all right, this is when I go. This is when I go cheat. Um, Yeah, it's one of those things. I mean, normally I would Google this shit, but um, I'm going to cheat and go back and look at another project where I've had to do this before. Um, and here's what this looks like. So I need to add some information to the manifest, and I need to say, here is the name of the class that I want you to run when you try to run this jar file as a, a you know, as an executable. Uh, when I ask you to do that with Java Jar. So I've changed build.gradle. I need to re-import things. Now, once I've done, let's, uh, let's try rebuilding my jar and see in, seeing if it's, anything has changed. Okay. Well, let's clean it first, just to make sure. Let's rebuild the jar. Okay, seems to be recompiling. All right, so now let's go back to the terminal and let's run this again. Um, if you're not familiar with the terminal, if you want to rerun the last command that you ran, you don't need to retype the whole thing, just use the up arrow. Your terminal maintains the history of the commands that you've run in the session that you're in, and so that you can just sort of browse through things like this. Okay, so now we have a different problem. So it's not complaining that it doesn't know how to start my application anymore, um, but it's claiming that it has this java.lang.no class def found error, and it's looking for a KTOR class. So this is where uh, we, this is what creates the need to build something that's called a fat jar. So let me show you uh, what's inside this particular jar file. Let me grab this and scroll it up a little bit. Um, and now let's do jar, give it, sorry, tvf is the right argument and then the path to the jar file. Okay, so here's what's inside this. This, this, this is something that just uh, essentially prints the contents. This is one file, but this file actually is a way of bundling together a bunch of other files. So you can see, um, hello, inside this directory hello are all the class files that the Kotlin compiler has created for our class. And you can see the Kotlin compiler actually creates quite a few classes, some of these are inner classes. I don't want to get into this in detail, but uh, you can see that there's a result class uh, that corresponds to 
pull this down and divide the screen a little bit better. So, you know, if I think about the classes I declared in my main uh, method, the result class, this data class that uh, was compiled into result.class, calculator request was compiled into calculator request.class, and then the main, my main method ended up in a class right here. Um, one of the things you'll note that you don't see in here is that there's no test test code. This is the reason why we use test implementation in build.gradle is that when we actually go to build our program, we want to deploy it, we don't want those test dependencies in there. They're not going to be used when we run our code for real, and so they're just they're taking up space. Um, and so when you declare them as a test implementation dependency, they don't get included when we build them. Okay, so, but the problem here, you'll see that the only, con the only thing in this jar file is stuff that we created for our app. It doesn't include all of the dependencies that I declared in my build.gradle file, right? So for example, it doesn't include Ktor, it doesn't include the Netty Ktor service, it doesn't include this JSON plug, right? And also doesn't include all of their dependencies, right? So each one of these projects has its own build.gradle and it declares its own dependencies. And so there's actually quite a bit of code that I'm building on top of when I create my simple web application that's not included in this jar file. So there, there are two ways to fix this, right? One is that you could install these dependencies and put them somewhere where Java can find them. When I'm working on my project, what happens is that Gradle is telling Java where to look for things and it's installing the stuff I want with the versions I want. It puts them somewhere that you know, we don't need to talk about. Um, but that's, what, that's why I can run my program when I'm running it through IntelliJ or with Gradle. But the problem is now I'm trying to build my program in a way that it can be run anywhere, okay? Um, and so what I could do, let's say I wanted, again, to send this jar file to somebody and they allow them to run it. Well, I could be like, okay, well, you have to install this version of Ktor and this version of Ktor Netty and this version of Ktor JSON, and then things will work. And that would be okay, I guess. Um, but I could also make things easier for them and bundle up everything together. Um, and so that's sometimes referred to as a, as a fat jar. Um, a fat jar contains not only the application code, but all the dependencies that you might need. So let's figure out how to do that. Um, happily, um, there is a Gradle plugin for this, as you might imagine. Um, the plugin is called Shadow. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Google's not helping us too uh, much here. Although I think if you go through this uh, tutorial, it will actually find you to the right place. But um, this is what we want to use. This is a really well-maintained plugin. You can see the last commit was a couple of days ago. Um, and this, this is a really good tool. There's a lot of people use it. Um, so let's, you know, we go to our, um, find our way to the documentation, go to the user guide, um, are getting started. And you can see there's some Gradle, um, some Gradle configuration here. We're going to install this as a Gradle plugin. Um, and we're going to add this to our project. This, um, this should do it, right? Now we need to modify this a little bit because this is another case where we're seeing syntax that's, that's uh, designed for Groovy. So you can see in Kotlin, if I paste this in, I need to enclose what's next to the ID um, thing here in ID is actually a function. And then my version string, I'll put it in double quotes just to match what I did before, okay. Once I do that, I'm good to go. Um, IntelliJ is telling me I need to re-import the project, and I'm going to do that. One of the fantastic things about this plugin is that it's completely trivial to use. Okay, so I've applied it to my project, and I'm basically done. Um, what we'll notice here is that when we go over here to the Gradle Tasks menu, um, the plugin has created a new sub-menu called Shadow. There's this. I've never run this before. Let's see what happens. Oh, check that out. That's so cool. Ask the art. Anyway, so <laughs> I, that, that's not the most useful part of the Shadow Jar plugin, but it's sort of fun. Um, the useful part of the Shadow Jar plugin is this thing called Shadow Jar. And this builds on top of our configuration for creating a normal jar. Um, but when we run this, what we're going to see is that it creates a much larger jar file. But it also creates a jar file that we can run immediately. It has everything in it that we could possibly need. Okay, so let's go back to... Uh, our terminal window, and now let's list the contents of our build directory, the libs subdirectory, and you can see now, let me use, 
sorry, I shouldn't stop using this alias. Some of you may not have it. So um, let's just list the content of this in the long format. You can see now there are two files in there, okay? So there's a, this is our original jar file that didn't have, that only had our classes in it. And this is now the fat jar. And the fat jar, if you can see by the file size over here, is much, much, much bigger. Our original jar was like 16 kilobytes. This one is like 13 megabytes, right? Um, it's much bigger. It contains everything that my program might need to run. Um, and if we look, we can actually use this, a similar command to the one that we used before to list the contents of this. And this goes on and on and on and on. And if you scroll through here, you'll see that this is the Netty, little Netty web server. This is the JSON library from Google. Uh, this is more parts of the Netty web server. I've gotten various uh, libraries from Kotlin. This is sort of part of the Kotlin standard library that gets included. Um, I've got everything. Okay, so now I've got this really nice self-contained world that should have everything that my application needs to run. So I shouldn't need any external dependencies on this, right? Let's try it and see if it works. All right, so before we ran this command and we said, uh, we gave it the path to hello dash 1.0 dash snapshot. Now we're gonna use um, build libs hello 1.0 snapshot dash all dot jar. And let's see what happens. Okay, so we see this typical error message, which we've learned to recognize, and we can get this to go away, but we'll just ignore it for now. Um, and it's sitting there, so maybe something good is happening. Let's check it out. Um, let's go over here, um, go back to our browser window. There we go. Okay, so now we've, we've this is the sort of step one on the way to packaging, right? We've seen that we've been able to create a fat jar um, that I can run anywhere. And, you know, literally, I could give you this jar file um, and assuming you had the right version of Java installed, um, uh, when did you come in? Yeah, it might be, I'm, I'm, I will post a video for this later. Um, it's a little bit tough given, you know, okay, if you were five minutes late, I, I feel like this should make a certain amount of sense. Um, if you have specific questions, go ahead and, and, and ask them and I'll try, to, I'll try to answer them. If you guys are lost, let me know, right? I'm totally happy to slow down. I'm not, I, I, it's hard, I don't have a lot of like feedback in this particular format. So um, terminal command for the jar, the one we just ran or the one above? Yeah, so we've run two commands uh, for the jar files. One was to look at the contents, so here's that command. So if I run jar tbf, that will print the contents of a jar file to the terminal. Um, if I wanna run the jar file, then I use this command java-jar. Um, these commands working depends on you having Java installed properly. The other thing I might check if you're trying to follow along is to make sure that your Java version looks okay. Ah, how do you build the jar file? Yeah, so I didn't build the jar file. Um, Gradle did that for me, right? So I built the jar file by, it's a good question, right? So there are two Gradle tasks that I now have available to build jar files. One is this jar task that builds the skinny jar that only has my code in it. The second one was added by the plugin that I installed a minute ago. That's the shadow jar plugin that builds everything. Uh, that includes a jar file that, that contains everything. So the question is, what's a jar file for, right? So again, at this point, I have a single file, right? Uh, so if I go into build libs, I have a single file. So let's say I wanted to run my web application on another machine. I have a single file that I could send to another machine. And assuming I have the right version of Java, I could just run that file there and it would work. Um, I shouldn't have to install anything else. I shouldn't have to fiddle with any libraries. I know exactly what code my application is using because it's all packaged in this jar file. Um, that's the utility of a jar file. It basically bundles up every part of my application, right? Uh, does that answer the question? You guys can talk to me too, I think. Um, anyway, yeah, so the idea behind a jar, I mean, it's, it's really a, a way of just creating a single file that, that 
uh, gathers together everything that I might I might need to run that particular application. I'm trying to think if there's a way for me to actually demo this. Um, why not? Let's try it. Um, yeah, and, and basically what we're going to do is we're now going to take that jar file and host it somewhere else, as, as David suggested. But let's actually, let's just have some fun with this. For, uh, let's just see uh, if we can get this to work, right? And yeah, jar is, is similar to a library. In fact, that's how uh, Java libraries are distributed. So when we, it's a great question. So when we, um, let me go back and get this guy uh, a little bit. Okay. So for example, when you tell uh, Gradle, I want to use this library, essentially what it does is it goes out and it gets a jar corresponding to that library. Inside that jar contains all the class files that the library provides, right? That contain all the compiled code that the library provides. So to some degree, when we build a fat jar, what we're doing is we're taking all of those individual jar files, um, not just the one that we need for our code, but all the ones that the libraries that we need use, and we're kind of combining them into one single thing. Um, so let's actually, let's have some fun with this, with this jar file concept. What I'm going to do is, I really hope I don't break anything. Um, let me see if I can find a machine. Well, you know what? How about we just do this on the CS125 machine, right? So I don't think there's anything running on port 8008 on cs125.edu right now. I hope not. I don't know why this is so slow. Um, that's strange. There's some place that I missed my website down. Let's see, okay, so that works. And now let's try, that yeah, should just, yeah, this should just break. I'm not sure why it's, why it's doing anything. Um, but let's see if we can actually get this deployed over there just for fun. Um, yeah, so basically anywhere we put this, will allow it, it's gonna provide the, the same API, right? So let's 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 try deploying this to, to CS125. I have not tested this, so I have no idea if it's working out, but it'd be fun. Okay, so I've got this jar file, right? Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy it to, uh, no, where did you go? I'm gonna copy that jar file, the fat jar, to my CS125 site. Uh, and then I'm gonna log into the CS125 web server I'm going to run java jar hello jar and it's running. Okay, so now let's go to CS125 and we'll go to this particular port. And I think this has, yeah, I think this has something to do with the um, way I've configured nginx on this particular machine. That's why it's, that's why we're having this problem. Um, I don't think I have another machine with a public IP address that we can use, but. Um, but we'll 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 uh, we'll see how this works in practice in a second. If if you're not, yeah, I mean Java should work, right? So this command should work. If it doesn't, then there's some Windows. This is probably a Windows specific thing you need to do to to get it to work. Okay, so let's 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 sally forth at this point and, and, and see if we can make a little bit more progress here. I think we can at least get to the point where we can create our Docker container this time and then I'll be happy to answer questions about this. Okay, so, so at this point we have the single file that has all of our dependencies in it um, and that file is runnable. Um, if, you know, on some level, if Java had taken over the world, then there'd be all these services that would volunteer to run our jars for us online. But it turns out that people actually want to build a variety things using a variety of different tools. And you know, recently there emerged this need for people to be able to deploy things easily. Um, and one of the tools that has emerged into the space or one of these um, capabilities in computers is this idea called containerization. And containerization is something that's worth like an entire week's worth of, of lessons. But, uh, so I'm certainly not gonna do it justice in about five minutes. But the idea behind a container is that I create a, a containerization allows me to define and to create a container that encapsulates everything that I need to run my application. And by this, I mean not just this jar file, but also the version of Java that I need, 
And for more complex containers, I can put all sorts of things in there, right? So you can have a container that inside is running a database, it's running you know, a caching service like Redis, um, you might have a very specific version of Python installed that your application needs, you might have libraries that it needs to run, whatever. So this container, it's almost like a little mini machine. Um, it's almost like you took an actual physical machine and you installed whatever, I mean, normally containers run on some type of Linux. Uh, you installed Linux on it, you installed exactly the packages that your system needed, and then you froze it into this very, very lightweight, easy to use format. And containers are essentially the building block on which the cloud is created. Um, the, when we talk about the cloud, what we're really talking about is a way to run, you know, the modern cloud has essentially evolved to be a way to run containers at large scale. Um, so if you look at how Google works, if you look at how, you know, big, I shouldn't say Google, I mean, every big web company, how they have designed their services, the vast majority are using some type of container to run the various parts of their system. So Google probably has containers that are running various components of their search um, infrastructure, right? Whether that means a container that's actually crawling the web and collecting results, another container that's participating in the indexing process, another container that's helping um, you know, support instant search, another container that's returning results for the, for the web front end, whatever, right? Um, and so, you know, again, I think this is, you know, I, I, I work with students frequently on projects. I would say if there's one thing that I would tell you guys to uh, get comfortable with and learn how to use, it's, it's containers. And by containers, the, the term that you, use in this, that you hear in this space a lot is Docker. Um, Docker didn't create containers. Containers are a, a, a feature that, um, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So containers are a feature that, were, that was, was added by operating systems a long time ago. Docker is a software tool that allows you to work with containers easily. So the question is, what's the difference between a container and a virtual machine? Um, and that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. The most important thing to understand about containers is that they are much lighter weight than a virtual machine. Um, a virtual machine actually frequently has a, its own separate operating system running inside of it, meaning that starting one up and shutting one down is a very, very slow process. So if anybody here has used, I don't know how many people here have used something like VirtualBox or VMware or whatever, um, those are really cool tools. And if you haven't used them, I would encourage you to experiment with them. But when you start up a virtual machine in VirtualBox, it takes like many minutes to boot. Right, before you can actually use it because there's a whole operating system running inside that. Thing. When we start a container, which we're gonna do in a second, you'll see it starts like that, right? And the reason is that the, the container is not running a completely separate system. It actually shares a lot of resources with your underlying system, um, but it still allows you to isolate things. So containers have become popular um, in this space because um, they are such a nice, balance between the isolation that you get through VM and performance requirements that you want when you're working with real systems. Um, I don't know what to do about Windows 10 version. Do, do we get, do you guys get Windows 10 licenses through Illinois somehow? Uh, that might be one, one potential approach, right? I don't know. I'm assuming that's for, well, I don't know. Yeah, hopefully that would run on, on Windows 10 EDU. Does anyone have Docker running on their Windows machine? I hope it works on EDU. All right, but let's 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 mess around with Docker a little bit. So I'll, I'll go through and demo this, and then you know this is something that we'll come back to throughout the semester, and it'll give you guys some time to kind of get, get, get comfortable with it. This is not a course on Docker, um, but you know I do feel like if you guys get a little bit of develop a little uh, comfort comfort level and familiarity with it, that would be pretty useful. Um, all right, so the the idea of behind Docker is that what we're going to do is to, to containerize an application where you want to define, we're going to create a container definition that describes exactly what our little web application needs to run. And there really is just one thing that our web application needs to run. Well, two things, right? One is it needs Java. And the second is that it needs this jar file that we just created. 
uh, that jar file has to be part of the container. So the way that we define uh, a Docker container is, is we create um, a file that's called a Docker file. The name is important, right? So you really have to get the name right. It's Docker file, you know, um, all one word, no camel case for the file. Uh, this file has a very specific format that we're going to follow. Um, so one of the things that's cool about Docker um, is that it allows us to build containers that are built on top of other containers, right? So before, remember what I was saying about um, creating a container, it's almost like we're going to set up a set of steps that are going to install exactly the things that we need on inside our container, nothing else. Um, and then that's going to produce this very, very lightweight, almost virtual machine that we can move around easily and, and pretty much run in lots of places, including on the cloud. Um, so here's how to do that. So the first thing we're going to do, um, first thing many, many Docker files do is we're going to start with another um, image. We're going to start with another container, right? Docker refers to an image. It's almost like the difference between a class and an object. An image um, is the description of what's inside a container, and the container is the image as it's running, right? Um, so again, you can Google this. Um, and so, you know, uh, I like to use these. So uh, one of the things that's exciting about the Docker ecosystem is there's a lot of people providing containers that you can use as starting points. Uh, we're going to use one that's based on OpenJDK. Um, this OpenJDK is a uh, organization that builds an open source version of Java. Um, that's you know one of the ones that I use on my machine all the time. It, as far as I understand it, it conforms to the Java spec, so it shouldn't behave any differently than the Sun version of Java. Um, you know, I'm I'm not going to go through all of this, but what we want is we want a container, and and so when you when you use another container, the naming convention is important, right? So this is frequently the first line in a Docker file. What this says is, I am building my container on top of this other container. Um, and so I inherit whatever's inside that other container. And so now let's, what we want is we want a, a, a container that has uh, OpenJDK 10. Okay, this is an old version of JDK, which is seven. So I'm gonna start this by saying from OpenJDK 10, right? Just following their, their example. Um, this gets me a starting point. All right. Now let's, and this is actually enough to get to get us started. And I think maybe what we'll do today is we'll just kind of play around in here a little bit and give you guys a sense of what's going on. Once I have a Docker file in a directory, I can run Docker build. Um, and Docker, sorry, Docker build. Docker build takes an argument, which is the directory that I'm running it in. So I'm using dot to refer to the current working directory. And then it takes, usually what you want to do is you want to tag, so this is what, um, we're now going to create a container. And I want to tag that container with some sort of uh, uh, label so that I can find it in a minute. Um, if you created an account on Docker Hub, you can use your Docker Hub username. You can really put anything you want in here. Um, I'm going to call this Java example. Um, so what is going on here? Uh, what are we watching happen? So, um, you know, again, Docker is a tool for working effectively with containers. And what Docker is doing right now is it is fetching, it's what you see here is a download. It's actually fetching the OpenJDK 10 container uh, or the OpenJDK 10 image, I'm sorry. And it's uh, fetching that and then it's kind of extracting it on my machine. Um, the way that this is done, and I don't want to go too much into the details of how Docker works, but Docker stores um, images as layers. So each layer represents a change to the file system that was uh, created by some operation that was performed when the image was built. So the OpenJDK 10 image looks like it's about 400 or 500 megabytes. So this will take a couple minutes to, to download and extract. Um, and when it's done, you'll see that I built a new container uh, and I tagged it with the name that I included up here. And it appends this latest, um, whenever I rebuild a container, it acquires this latest 
uh, version. This is how Docker refers to the latest version of a, of a container that I've built or of an image that I've built. Okay. So now I've got this newly created image, right? Again, an image is very much like a class in Java. It describes the container that I'm going to run, but it's not running itself, okay? Um, instead, what I need to do is actually run this thing. Um, and so right now, this container doesn't do anything. It just contains the contents that I inherited from OpenJDK 10. But I can still play around with this, right? So someone was saying before, you know, how is this sort of like a virtual machine? Well, let's find out. So one of the things I can do with Docker is I can run a command inside an existing image. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say run. The IT says, give me an interactive shell. And then I give it the name of an image that I want to run. Okay, um, and this actually just launched me right into uh, the, uh, a Java shell, right? Um, and I didn't actually know that was gonna happen. Um, so it looks like I can actually play around with Java in here. Um, let's see. If you're getting this message, yeah, uh, well, pseudo, pseudo might help, but you also need to make sure that your Java uh, Docker uh, uh, daemon is running. Um, okay, so, so there's clearly something running inside this container. Um, let's, let's use a slightly different um, container for a minute because I actually want to be able to run a shell in there just to kind of show you what, what's going on. So I'm going to change this, and now I'm going to change this to this tag. So this is going to give me now a OpenJDK container that is based on version 10. It contains the Java runtime environment and it's slim. And this is based on, I think, a version of Ubuntu, okay? So now let's rebuild our container. Um, you're gonna see in this case that the, um, some of the layers already existed on my machine, um, but it's still doing a similar process of extracting one of the layers that it needs. And now let's run this again. Okay, so now what's happening? So now I'm actually inside the container that I created. You can see that I have a shell. Um, the host name of the machine is this completely bizarre, um, you know, series of like hexadecimal, you know, whatever. Um, if I do ls, I can see that I'm, this is something that looks very much like the root directory of a Unix system. And that's what it is. Um, so what I, when you run a command inside the container, you're now inside the container. I said this was like a separate, um, a separate machine, and it's acting a lot like a separate machine. It has its own file system. There are its own files in here. And let's make sure that I can run Java. I suppose that's one of the reasons why I did this in the first place. Okay, I can run Java, and you can see that the Java version uh, that's installed in here was built on Debian. This is a, a Unix, a Linux type system. It's version 10.0.2. One of the important things to understand about this is that uh, containers by default are ephemeral. So they don't persist information. So let's say that I create a file in here. Uh, okay, so now I've created a, I'm, I'm the root user, I've created a file called blah that I can see right here. If I exit out of here and run this again, that blah file is gone. And so again, when I was saying before about one of the reasons people use containers um, when they are building these types of services is because this is how long it takes that container to start. It's really fast, right? So in the time it took for that shell to come back, Docker created an entire container and started it running. If you've ever run virtual machines before, you know they take way longer than that to start up, right? It's much more like booting an entire physical machine where it can take several seconds, right? Docker containers, well, sorry, containers start up extremely long. Okay, okay. So, again, and I'm, not, I'm sure this is sort of like, you know, getting blasted by a fire hose of information, but uh, we have like three more lines that we need to write in here, um, okay? So all we've done so far is we've created this container that, can, that inherits all the contents of the OpenJDK JRE Slim uh, container. Let me see the file type. I don't, I don't know why, you, why do you need to create a file type? So if I click on, right click on a project and hit new file, it just asks for a name, right? Um, 
the, the Docker file does not have an extension. It shouldn't be .txt or anything. It's just a plain file. Um, it has a format. You can see that IntelliJ recognizes it. I installed this Docker plugin that it suggested I install, so that may be why there's syntax highlighting. Okay, so the Docker file, you know, if you guys have, have worked with make files before, the Docker file, it's, it's good to think about a Docker file sort of like a make file. It contains a series of instructions that are used to build a new container image. Okay, so all I've told it so far is where to start from. I want to start with a container image that is OpenJDK, you know, this is the tag for it. Docker knows where to find that, and it's going to start me with the contents that are already inside that image. But there were two things that I needed in order to run my application. The first one was Java. So I've got Java, and I know exactly what version of Java I have. If I wanted to be more specific, I could add like Java, you know, you can add things to this tag. Um, but now I have a very specific version of Java in the container, which I'm happy about. But I need that jar file. So how do I do that? Um, so happily, when I run my Docker file and when I use it to build a container, I'm allowed to copy things into the container. The way I do that is this copy command. So copy takes two arguments. The first place argument is uh, where, well, sorry, let me do something first. I'm gonna set my, uh, there's a command called workdir. That sets the working dir inside the container. I'm going to set that, I don't think this has to be quoted. I'm going to set that to root. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy build libs and let's do this. Just to remind ourselves what we want. I'm going to copy this file. I'll get the last piece of this. Try to. There it is. I'm going to copy this file into my container. So copy actually takes two arguments. The first argument is where is the file relative to the directory where the Docker file lives? The second argument is where should I put it in the container? Okay, and so I'm gonna say hello.jar. All right, um, so now let's run this and, and we'll see what happens. Um, just be able to quit out of J shell. I think if you just control D, um, that'll work. Okay, so I've got my Docker file. Now we need to run that build, rerun that build command. So let's do this again. Um, okay, so now you'll see that there was a couple of other steps that were taken. I set the working directory to be the root directory, and I copied this file. So let's make sure that the file ended up where I, I think it should. Okay, so now I'm going to go. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to run bash. Let me put this at the end. So basically, this says run the bash command inside the container named Jeffrey Challenge slash Java example and open up an interactive shell. Okay, so now I'm inside my container again, and let's make sure that the file that I expected to be there is there, and it is, check that out. So now I've created a container that not only contains Java, which is one of the things I wanted, but it also contains my jar file. And so now, if I run Java jar and I pass the name, you'll see that it's gonna do the right thing, it's gonna start up my web application. So this is pretty cool, okay? Um, the last thing um, I need to do is this. So on some level, you can think of a container as kind of something that's designed to be executed, right? A lot of times we run a container, we want it to do something. In our case, when we run our container, we want it to run our web application. And so the last thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna add this um, bit to our, um, and I'll explain what this means in a second. So you guys can probably guess. So this command says, when this container is started, it should do the following thing. It should, and, and I have to, for historical reasons, you have to write this out this way. You basically have to give it the command you want with each argument separated by commas and quoted, okay? So let's get out of our container. Let's go back and run um, our, let's build our example again, okay? And now, if I run my example, and I don't say bash, if you, if you give it a command, it's still gonna run the command that you told it to run. But if I don't give it a command, it's gonna run the command that I defined in the Docker file. And so now, it's actually running my web application. I can see the log messages that I expected to see, and it's sitting there waiting for input. So now let's go and we'll, we'll go to our local host, 
We'll go back up here and we'll see if this works. And it does, okay? And so, and so the question is, why not? Um, and the answer is because the container really is its own machine. Um, it's running on my machine. It's sharing resources with my machine, but it is not my machine. And so if I want to expose parts of the container to uh, outside the container, I need to tell Docker to do that, right? And so the argument that I'm gonna use here is I'm gonna say, um, I think it's P, right, sorry. I'm gonna say P and then I'm gonna do this. I hope that's the right thing. And then when I go over here, it's gonna work, all right? Now, what did I do here? So this is a, a flag to the Docker command that tells it map port 8008 from the host to port 8008 in the container, okay? These don't have to be the same. I could change the host port that I'm going to use, right? So I know that my web application expects to re receive requests on port 8008, but I can tell it that I can map port 8118 from localhost to port 8008 inside the container. And so now the container thinks that it's getting a request on port 8008, but I'm actually providing a request on port 8118. And this is one of the other reasons that people use containers because it allows you to do all of these really powerful remappings between the resources that are running on the actual um, host and the resources that are running inside the container, right? By default, I don't have to uh, share anything with the container, right? I can also, I'll show you one other thing that's fun. I can also do share my file system with the container. So I can do something called um, a bind mount. So in this case, I'm going to, um, you know, I need to put it somewhere, let's see here. Will this work? I'll try it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna run bash. And now, oh wait, I need to add the IT argument. So I'm running an interactive command. And now if I go into the test directory and do it, you'll see the contents of the directory that I was working in on my host machine. And these are kept in sync. So if I touch a file on the host, you'll see that that file has been created. Uh, sorry, if I touch a file inside the container, you'll see that file has been, has been uh, created on the host. And so Docker allows me to set up all of these mappings in a very flexible way between my host machine, which is the machine that's actually running Docker, and any of the containers that I can create inside that. Okay, so we are, we're you know, basically out of time. So I think I'm gonna skip uh, the last step today because it is um, probably the most, one of the most confusing. Um, but one of the, you know, again, so now, you know, let's, let's just kind of back up and review what, what we've been able to accomplish. So initially, because what we've been doing is we've been essentially kind of building up more and more sophisticated packaging approaches that allow us to easily deploy and distribute our application. So the first thing we did is we built a jar file. The problem with the jar file is the jar file didn't contain all of the libraries that I needed to run the program. Um, and so to, in order to use it, somebody would have had to install all those libraries and get the right versions and stuff like that, right? And that's a pain. Um, the second approach was that I got it to the point where my jar file contained all of the dependencies that my application needed, right? Um, so I built this fat jar. So now, as long as somebody had Java installed, then they can run my application. But, you know, again, that requires having Java installed. And sometimes I might want to run multiple different web applications on the same system that use different versions of Java. And so there's still this external dependency, right? Um, and it's inflexible, it's tied to Java, right? So basically, if again, if the whole world was using Java and everybody agreed that's only going to write Java applications, I'd be fine, but people want to do other things. And so containers take us up to another one. Right, where now it's like, all I need on the machine is a way to run containers. And I can run anything um, as long as I can containerize. So now that we've created this container that, um, that contains our application, I can distribute that container to any machine that's using Docker and it can be run there. And again, this is actually how real 
large scale corporate clouds are built, right? So we maintain it's like a 12 node cloud for CS125. That's where we run all of our backend services for the course. And essentially on each one of those machines, the only thing that we care about having installed is Docker, okay? Because Docker is gonna do all of the rest of the work for us. And the, we run a variety of different services on those machines. They're all containerized. And so Docker doesn't care what's in the container, right? Docker fetches the container, runs the container for us. Some of those containers contain Kotlin-based Java web APIs, just like the one that we've been designing. Some of them contain Node.js-based web backend services. Uh, some of them contain other stuff, right? So it doesn't matter, right? Anything I can put inside a container, I can now deploy onto this uh, computing fabric, essentially, right? Um, and again, this is sort of like, so, so containers have become the modern uh, unit of service deployment, right? This is how everybody out there in the real world is actually designing their systems and how they're deploying, right? Um, all right, so I think that's a good stopping point for today. Um, I don't think we're going to meet on Friday um, because it's the last day before break and we're sort of busy trying to, you know, figure out how to get CS125 in shape for uh, potential offline use after break. Um, so anyway, I'll post obviously this video and the, um, the code from it and then uh, when we come back, we'll look at some other Kotlin things like concurrency and we'll also get to the point where we actually are able to deploy our Docker container on top of an actual, uh, somewhere we could actually use it, right? So we'll be able to take this container that we built, um, first of all, push it to Docker's container registry and then, um, and then deploy it on Amazon's container service. So yeah, no, no Zoom lecture on Friday, I'm not planning one. I hope you guys have a great break. Um, and you know, feel free to ask questions on the forum, we'll definitely help you. I know there's a bunch of new tools that we've introduced today. Uh, it's not exactly about Kotlin, but you know, these are things that I think are extremely valuable to know if you want to work in sort of a modern computing ecosystem. So, so anyway, I will uh, look forward to, hope you guys have a great break. I will look forward to seeing you um, after break, assuming that we're all back here and not, you know, somewhere else. So um, I will talk to you guys later and, you know, travel safely.